What's up guys and gals, my name is Splattercat and we are here in the Nerd Castle with the next episode of Shadowrun Dragonfall. In the previous episode, we had gone to a AG Chemical Corporation Europa something and we had disengaged a gas chamber. This room was full of like phosgene gas I think it was, which is quite bad for you. Definitely not good for the old lung and respiratory system. But anyways, we're trying to recover the Mark VI prototype and we just kind of been fanning through the building. So after finding ourselves a super sweet bottle of alcohol, they had also the Shock Welland Rider, so this is kind of one of those missions where a bunch of factions are all playing against each other. We have been contacted by the Shock Welland Rider, which if you remember, the Shock Welland Rider are a group of people that want free information. They're basically kind of like the Anonymous, or they're sort of like, oh, I don't know. They're kind of the WikiLeaks, I guess, of the future. We had also gotten a contact from Luca Dwer from the Lodge, who had wanted us to deliver the Mark VI to him, and I still haven't made a choice as to whether we're going to go back on the job or not. I... I don't know. I'm just really kind of stuck. I don't like betraying jobs because I'm a person with a sense of honor and I really, if I sign a contract, I like to stick to it. Oh, there's a dead girl. There's a dirt guy. The scientist lays dead beside a small pile of smashed glass and a number of beakers have been knocked over on the nearby table. Yeah, no kidding. He gassed himself out. This computer is powered on, but in sleep mode, when the screen comes to life, you find half-written text file on the screen. The timestamp on the most recent edit tells you that it was written just a few minutes ago. I didn't sleep last night. Doesn't look like I'm gonna sleep tonight, either. The last test batch failed. My fault. I got the mixture wrong. Sloppy work, Jensen. I can barely keep my eyes open, but I gotta try again. No excuses in this office. I despise relying on stimulants, but I've got no choice. I have to keep going. Progress marches on. Starting a new batch. If Hossoffer's pet isn't ready to be tested tomorrow, well, it's best not to think about it. I've gotta concentrate and remember lab safety. Keep alert, keep awake. One wrong mook is spelled disaster. <laughs> Glancing back at the menu, it looks like there are log entries reaching back for a few weeks. All of the entries are attributed to the same author, and none of them appear to be password protected. Alright, well let's go to the one dated two weeks ago. The new formula arrived today, Formula 17. I swear, whoever names these things must have no imagination at all. Formula 17? Really? Still, I can't wait to start working on it. From what I've read, early clinical trials were promising in the extreme. Amazingly potent, this stuff. An increased potency means less frequent injections at a lower dosage. There's nothing lo not to like. Despite my enthusiasm, there's still much to be done. Speeding up absorption rates is first on the list, and I have some concerns regarding the subject's immune reactions. Perhaps the formula could be tailored on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. Or read the one that was dated last week. Tailoring doses to individual patients has worked wonders. The key was taking a gene therapy-based approach. They've been using it in medicine for ages, so why not apply the same logic here? In a nutshell, I've used the subject's own DNA to delude their immune system into believing that Formula 17 belongs in their bodies, simple and effective. This approach has helped to increase the formula's absorption rate, as well as significantly reducing incidences of rejection. Unfortunately, it also rules out an easily mass-produced product, but I am convinced that the results will justify the additional costs. Yesterday's entry. A week! He waits an entire week before telling me the tailoring in the mixture is an unacceptable solution, and then he tells me that the trials are to begin tomorrow. I have no time, and Gisbrecht's applying so much pressure that I can barely think, the bastard. Hossoffer's probably threatening him. All of them can go rot. Maybe now that Hossoffer is playing to heat the sheets with Gies, Gies Breck's secretary, he'll learn to lighten up. We can only hope. Anyway, I have some new ideas to move forward with the formula. Admittedly, they're far-fetched, possibly even dangerous, but if I don't start producing some results, I get the feeling there won't be any problem for me, or it won't be a problem for me much longer. Wish me luck, Journal. It's science time. It's about to get his Bill Nye on. Let's have another look around the lab and figure out what we can locate here. We've got what looks like some kind of batch, and it's a batch of jazz, I guess. We'll get rid of that. A med kit, which obviously didn't do him much good. What he needed was a gas mask. On the counter is a note, carefully transcribed in neat handwriting. The paper bears the letterhead of senior executive Leonard Stromberg. I'm still waiting for that report. When I said ASAP, I meant I needed it yesterday. Stay until you've completed the test, then leave the report on my desk. The door code is 54139. Do this tonight. I'll expect to see it waiting for me when I arrive tomorrow. Stromberg. Alright, well let's go play that. 54139. Kind of expecting an alarm to go off at any moment though. Right, and so the door is now open, and this is the CEO's office, so let's take a look at what we have here. A 
stack of business cards on this desk reveals that it belongs to one Annika Schroeder. A cursory search reveals that the desk drawers are stuffed full of lewd love notes and all hastily written on scraps of office stationery. Rummage through the notes. Exploring Annika's desk is like embarking on an odyssey of filth. Thirty seconds in, you've already learned there are three new euphemisms for sex in a storage closet, as well as exciting new definitions for a variety of common office terms. Thankfully, your search also turns up something of more immediate value. A scrap of paper with a name and a five-digit code scribbled on it. Hossoffer, 84792. God. On the desk is a little folder, a file folder labeled Project Atlas. We open the folder and it's fine that it's, an ex it, that it's empty except for a single note. Move to a digital archive and locked under executive authorization. Authorization, God. My reading skills just seem to continually go down as I go through this. So we've got a new objective. I guess that was just kind of an update. Alright, well, I don't really know what we want to be doing here. There's a trash can over there. I'm not going to summon any spirits yet. Although, I don't know if there's a downside to doing it right now. Maybe we should. Let's find out. Let's learn some things. This could be a terrible, terrible idea. You reach out into the astral plane, beckoning to any spirits that might be listening. Eventually, you receive a response. A feeling of comfort washes over you as the spirit of the hearth makes itself manifest. I am the spirit of this domain. You have summoned me, and so I am yours. How may I serve? What is on the floor above? I know little about what is above. The wards are too strong for spirit kind to penetrate. Only bland, physical creatures such as yourself may pass. Thanks for that sideways insult. Passive-aggressive much, hearth spirit? How do I get up to the next floor? I know little of the next floor. It is warded against my kind. However, there is a box. A box that climbs a tunnel like the one you came in. If you use this box, it is on the far side of the building, but this is my domain and I see it as well as I do the rest. How may I serve? You said a few people ever used that elevator? Who have you seen using it? Until recently, only one. A human man. There's a pause as the spirit collects its thoughts. Now the man, but also a woman, never at the same time as the man. Last night there was a change. A group rode the elevator, towing something foul. It bled a cloud of corruption into the astral plane. I fled from it. I had no choice. I can still feel the wrongness of it oozing down from above, polluting the magic of this place. Thank you, spirit. I have another question. Tell me about the man. His aura is dark and cold. Others move from his path and flashes of fear spread through the auras of all those around him. He believes himself to be of great import. Each day upon his arrival, he travels above. He remains in that place until the sun falls, then he leaves to return the next day. Tell me about the woman. Her aura shines bright with energy, but I see flecks of the man's darkness beginning to take hold within her. On the rare occasions that I have seen them together, her aura reaches out to meet his. She offers her energy and brightness to him, and she does it willingly. How she can stand to feed such a connection eludes me, but then, your physical creatures have always been a mystery to me. The woman also serves another man. She follows him, cleans for him, and provides for him. He lacks the strength and darkness of the man from above and clearly fears him, but the woman cares for him all the same. Tell me more about the foulness. I can tell you little. It was shielded from my sight. Yet such great pain and sorrow can never fully be hidden. From the cracks in its armor poured a foul cloud of wrongness and death. It left a stain on everything that it passed, and I was afraid. Most terribly of all, I sensed a presence, buried deep, a twisted nexus of pain and loathing, suspended in the cloud of filth, and in the center of that cloud, awareness. How do I go into the elevator? All who enter the elevator, as you call it, first perform a ritual of entrance, a series of strange tapping motions on the pad mounted beside it. The man has done this always. After she was summoned, the woman took up the ritual as well. Do you know the ritual? No. I know little about your technology, and what I do know is not entice me to learn more. How may I serve? How was this woman summoned? The summons was delivered via parchment. Ever since then, she has regularly traveled above, and what of the parchment? It was set aflame, then discarded. It was destroyed? Some yet remains. Where are the remains of the parchment? It was discarded, along with the myriad refuse that you meat brings produce. From there, it was moved to a larger receptacle to await removal. I assume that it is still there. What larger receptacle? Three receptacles sit together behind the most distant door in this room. The furthest from us now holds what you seek. Where does this woman sit? The woman sits behind the closest door when she's not visiting the dark man above. Okay. Interestingly enough... So he said the farthest door... There's a trash receptacle. 
I like this. It's kind of like a mystery. We're not actually doing a whole lot of shooting on this mission. It's a little bit of a break. A partially burnt code, 847. Okay. Let's have a look at the different codes that we've accumulated thus far and look for anything that might be similar. So we've got 847. Found in a trash bin in the janitor's closet. There are an I see more get if elevator code. Okay. And so we've got a five digit code for Hosshoffer's or whatever his name's office. So let's keep looking around. I'm going to go into this room last over here just because there's so much security in there that I'm going to guarantee a shootout when I go in. It looks like an armory of some sort. I see, yeah, weapon racks and things like that. So we'll probably hit that pretty shortly. But for now, it's probably going to be the last destination that we decide to visit. Nothing enticing in this room. And I don't see anything in this room either. So does this go upstairs? This is probably the one that goes upstairs. Authorization for access to executive elevator. Well, let's examine the keypad. Your third eye slips open. It reveals the hidden world of the astral plane. Several of the buttons on the keypad glimmer faintly. 24789. Each of these buttons has been pressed recently. The residue of life clings to them, shimmering against the gray. So 24789. Two, four, seven, eight, nine. So if we know, and you'll forgive me for a moment because I am going to take a pad here. I'm going to start writing some of this down. So we know that the first three digits are 847. So we've got 847. And then what were the other ones? It didn't write them down for us. I was hoping it would write down the rest. So let me get those numbers one more time. And it's examine the keypad. There we are. It's 24789. So we've got two, four, seven, eight, and nine. We've already used eight, we've already used seven, and we've already used four. That leaves us with either eight, four, seven, two, nine, or eight, four, seven, nine, two. So we'll try both of those. We'll go eight, four, seven, nine, two first. And there it is. Access granted to the 25th floor. We're not going to take it just yet because I do, I'm kind of worried about whatever security alert we might set off if we go after this. And was that the code for... Oh, I already had the code. God, I already did that all out of the way. I was, I don't know what it was. For some reason, my brain didn't make the connection. I said that I was going to go to my inventory because I thought those looked familiar. And then I got caught up kind of looking around and staring at armories. Whatever. I like to double check my work. We'll leave it there. Long way around. And then we've got Giesbrecht's authorization code, which is found inside the laboratory. What do we use that for? I do want to make sure that we use every single thing that we find in this place, just to make sure that everything that we want is in our hands by the time we leave this place, because we do have a lot of interested parties that are all willing to pay a lot of money for anything we might want to do. So in this thing, we might enter maybe Atlas. And then we have the door code. Okay, and so I need to... Let me take a look at it. It was that long code in there. In our inventory. It's going to be... 54139. Okay, so that's not that long. Let's go ahead and back on out of here. And on searching Atlas, we'll get back in here. And so the code was 54139. Authorization accepted. Welcome, Herr Stromberg. Mark, five, or Mark 6 prototype data stored under Project Atlas heading, redirecting inquiry. Project Atlas. Volumes of information begin to flit across the screen. A good half of what you're seeing has been redacted, and the rest is written in impossibly dense corporate speak. Let's go corporate etiquette and attempt to decipher the text. You scan the archived information, collating it in your head as you go. Within a, few sentence, a or within a few seconds, a picture begins to form in your mind. From what you can tell, the ultimate goal of Project Atlas is to circumvent the effects of essence loss in metahuman subjects. Apparently, a number of working prototypes have been built over the last year to test the theories put forward by project scientists. The most recent of these has been designated Mark 6. 
The report isn't all sunshine and rainbows. There are death reports in here. The mortality rate among test subjects has been appallingly high. The report also makes reference to Formula 17, a substance that's being developed in support of Project Atlas. Volumes of information. Okay, so we're back. Let's access the visual record. VP level authorization required. I don't know if that's going to be... The same code as before? Okay, good. VP authorization... Oh, we don't have it. Well, what if... No, that was worth a shot. Well, what do we do about this then? Let me take a look and make sure that I haven't missed anything. We're going to project data for the shock well and writer. You copy the information on screen, redactions and all. And then for the visual record... So we have geese bricked. But we don't have the other code we need, so we need the vice president's code. Let's take a look around and see if we can't track that down. I'm really enjoying this mission because there's a lack of shooting. And sometimes when you get these missions, you're like, oh, we're not going to be shooting anybody. I don't care. This is going to suck. But let's see here. Junior executive, Werner Hardegger. Okay, so he's not going to help us. Stromberg, I don't think, is the VP. This may be information that we have to find from the floor above. So now we have an option in front of us. Do we start a shootout with these guys right here? We know the question. Let's do it. Let's start a shootout. Why not? I mean, there's only one piece of loot in that room. So it may not be worth the shootout. security room let's come back to it we'll go upstairs first and if we find that we trigger an alarm anyways and we end up having to unleash the DACA to get out of here well I keep my DACA on a leash by the way it seems like it's the best thing to restrain the DACA like the DACA is much like a dog in fact I always wanted to have a dog named DACA probably a Saint Bernard or something big old woolly mother just be like yes it's DACA woogie 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 and then you like I, the thing I like about dogs with floppy ass faces like they've got like those folds you know so when they would like fight with wolves and stuff they wouldn't be able to get a hold of them that's why they bred them to have floppy faces, by the way. So that when they fought with animals, it wouldn't hurt them too badly. But anyways, with St. Bernard's, in particular, the best thing to do if they've got those faces is you just take their face and you go... Blah, 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 on, the, like, on the sides with your hands, and their face just like flops around all over the place like slop. It's great. I love doing that to floppy face dogs. I don't know why. It's enjoyable. The elevator whisks you upward toward the executive level 25th floor. As expected, the run has been relatively smooth sailing so far. A chime breaks the silence as the elevator glides to a stop. Mark 6 is somewhere on this floor, and all that you need to do is find it. But yeah, it's been one of my lifelong dreams is to have a St. Bernard, but unfortunately, being as po' folks as I am, I live in an apartment, and apartment life would be incredibly cruel to a dog that large, so I don't, I mean, I'm... Too nice. I don't want to do that to an animal. It's almost too small for cats around here, but I just simply can't do without my feline friends. Oh, it's not going to let me go back down, so maybe we won't be able to go back to that floor. That's disappointing. The emergency lights wink out, leaving you in darkness. A moment later, the building lights flip on, cranked all the way up to the full illumination. The light is uncomfortably bright. A quick check of your comm link shows that your security feed has been terminated. Instead of a command view of the 24th floor, you find yourself staring at a blank screen. Well, that can't be good. No, it's not. You get the feeling we've been sold down the river again. There comes a point where you just get used to it in Shadowrun. You just, like, you know that you're going to get sold down the river every few seconds. Why is this thing effervescing? Like, why is it shooting sparkles all over the place? Seems a little skimp with things to investigate. I suppose we'll just use the door then. Oh, I don't like this. The music just turned off. The door slides open with a pneumatic hiss. An enormous figure fills your vision. It stands motionless by a console in the corner of the room. Almost every inch of the thing is covered in dull steel and gleaming chrome. It's mechanical arms and an articulated hands that wouldn't look out of place on an industrial machine. Bulky, cumbersome things designed for crushing power rather than finesse. Clutched in one of those crushing hands, a chain gun glints with sinister purpose. That shouldn't be possible. Nothing implanted with that much chrome can be implanted with that much chrome and live. It isn't moving. I think that it's, I don't know, on standby or something. 
The lights are on, but nobody's home. The figure stands completely still, but its eyeless head fidgets in agitation. Something about it reminds you of a snake tasting the air. Off to one side, the screen of a control console glows cheerfully in the gloom. Yeah. You know what? I want this thing on my side. Let's do it. Guess who's on my side? You're on my side. Woogie 3.0. Hell yeah. Mark 6 Cyber Zombie Prototype Control Console. <laughs> this Mark 6 prototype is the exclusive property of AG Kemi Ropa. Unauthorized access is prohibited. To put the prototype into demonstration mode, you may activate its systems from the following menu. Alternatively, the system can be directly piloted via remote control rig. Press any key to continue. Blitz's eyes go wide. Chief, did you just read that? I am going to drive the hell out of this thing. Be my guest. Just let me look over the console first. All right, sure, yeah. All right, due diligence and all that. Just, like, don't take too long, okay? This is like a golden opportunity, and I don't want to waste it. He steps back, allowing you to return your attention to the control... Let's, oh god, that's gonna be like, let's read a zombie, the zombie zombie's aura. Your third eye slips open, and instantly the drab ugliness of the mundane world is washed away, obliterated by the glowing energies of the astral plane. Something is wrong here, very wrong. The cyber zombie's aura is almost completely black. To your horror, the light of your own aura seems to be drawn toward it. You can feel a twisting sensation in your gut, and it takes all of your willpower to keep from blacking out. Yeah, we're gonna retreat on that one. Reflexively, your third eye clenches shut. The world of beauty and the astral plane disappear from view, taking the horror of the cyber zombie's aura with them. Taking a moment to catch your breath, you find yourself standing in front of the control console. The cyber zombie stands there, unmoving, just as it did before. Access the system's README file. <laughs> Mark 6 prototype demonstration model. This Mark 6 prototype incorporates top of the line cyberware from all AG Chemi Europa subsidiaries, including the Zeiss Dead Sight Laser Designator, but <laughs> the Butt Heavy Industries Power Lift Industrial Cyber Arms, and the brand new Zeiss Sense Shell Cyber Skull. Where necessary, competitors' projects have been incorporated into the platform Ares Dermal Plating, Universal Omnitech Move By Wire, etc. These systems should be considered placeholders for this proof of concept prototype. The biological component of the Mark 6 was selected for size and durability by General Genetics worldwide. All autonomous functions necessary for the, to maintain the biological component are original to the component itself and should be self-regulated within operational limits. As proof of concept demonstration model, the Mark 6 was designed for remote operation. A Zeitz Eye in the Sky drone control system has been incorporated into the Mark 6 Cyberskull. Comlink control is also possible for the casual control, but for product demonstration purposes, use of the drone control system is advised. Armaments. The Mach 6 prototype comes equipped with an Ares Vanquisher vehicular rotary cannon to demonstrate the Mach 6 actuated strength and recoil suppression capabilities. The model is also equipped with a global polymer monofilament axe for demonstration purposes. This weapon has been designed with a heft well beyond the lifting capacity of any un unaugmented metahuman. The Mach 6, of course, can swing it with ease. Long-term goals in demonstrating the Mach 6 combat capabilities, this office has hoped that AG Chemi Europa's newly developed Formula 17 Cybermatic Regent or Reagent will prove its value to the board of directors both as an astonishing technical achievement and as a lucrative new revenue stream for the company. Albert Hossoffer, Senior VP, Berlin Facility. Okay, well... We'll have Glory look at it. Glory nods and steps forward. As she stands next to the cyber zombie, you can't help but notice how much of the chrome riddles her own body. The cyberware is high grade, quality stuff, but not mil spec. Her, the arms look industrial in design, interesting choice, but there's nothing wrong with it. The control system looks interesting, though. Like a drone control interface, but it's wired into the base of the skull. From the positioning, I'd say that it's connected directly to the thing's brainstem. Glory takes a closer look at the cyber zombie's control module. A moment later, she takes a sudden half step back. She turns to look at you, a disgusted look on her face. Three Toe, listen to me. We have to kill this thing. This thing is our payday, Glory. Explain yourself. This... this troll... is still conscious. He's still conscious. They've outfitted him with an inhibitor chip. He's trapped in his own body, screaming to get out. This isn't just a prototype, Thredo. It's a person. We just... we... we can't cash him in for a paycheck. Can you do anything about it? Help him in some way? She takes another look at the control module, scowling. No promises, but I can try. Do it. Not here. Let's get him down to the garage first. I want to have the van close by in case anything goes wrong. In the meantime, we're going to have to activate him. She falls back to a regular position in the group. Just remember, Three-Toe, that's a man you're giving orders to, not a machine. Alright, Blitz, do your thing. Blitz shifts uncertainly as he patches the cyber zombie into his drone control network. This is, a uh, strange, Chief. The cyber zombie's massive hands flex twice and it takes a half step forward. Its mouth twists into a wide grin. But, uh, I think that I could get used to this. Input command. Let's extract a visual record from the cyber zombie. 
Warning, subject is currently in standby mode. Subject must be shut down to safely extract visual records via cortical transfer. Extracting visual records may have adverse effects on the subject. Possible side effects include intense pain, convulsions, and brain damage. Do you want to continue? No, if we're going to try and get him out, let's abort the extraction process. I'm going to try and do the humanitarian thing here and get him out. Let's activate him and step away. You hit the activation console and the cyber zombie lurches to life. It takes a step forward and you can hear the whir of actuators calibrating to adjust to its weight. A few seconds later, the whirring sound dies down. It relaxes into a slight crouch. I got it, Chief. The Mark VI is under my control. But it's strange. The thing's reactions feel off somehow. It's almost like something else is in there with me. We can talk about it later. For now, let's concentrate on getting out of here. Activation complete. Follow and protect. Protocol engaged. Awaiting further instructions. Let's go ahead and I'm going to break the episode off right here because I feel like things are going to heat up pretty rapidly. I've made up my mind already. If he's conscious in there, we're going to try and get him out. I feel like this is kind of one of those horrible things that arises when cyber technology goes wrong. Transhumanism at its worst. But anyways, my name is Splattercat. I will see you guys in the next episode. Take care out there, everybody, and hi-do.